Good evening and welcome. It's uh, a great pleasure to introduce to you tonight to Dr. Claire Haig, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science here at St. John's and St. Ben's. Uh, Claire did her undergraduate work at the University of Sydney in Australia, which is where she grew up, and a master's degree at the University of Hawaii, and then a doctorate at the University of Oklahoma, which she completed in 2006, and then came to St. John's. Uh, she is coming fresh off her first sabbatical uh, semester uh, last fall, in which she researched how the contemporary Tea Party relates to similar other populist movements in industrial countries and how the movement both engages and energizes the adherents. Uh, during one of the many debates uh, that were held among the Republican candidates, the question was asked one evening, if you could get to a position where there were nine dollars of cuts and one dollar increase in taxes, would, would you be able to agree to that? All eight candidates said no. No rhinestone Republicans, huh? No load of compromise on, on the road to their horizons on this issue. So the title of Dr. Haig's presentation tonight, Uncommonly Angry Mind, The Tea Party and Populism in America. Please give her a warm welcome. Party 
in Canada, the Reform Party actually no longer exists. However, one of the original leaders of the Reform Party, <coughs> Stephen Harper, and Stephen Harper is currently the Prime Minister of Canada, um, uh, he's the leader of the Conservative Party. So um, some kind, at some point, uh, the Reform Party became the Alliance, uh, the Canadian Alliance, um, and then uh, turned back into the Conservative Party. So the, the, the Reform Party was sort of out of the mid 80s. It has some of the same issues. I have to say, however, um, I'm very hesitant to say anything about Preston Manning. I think he's actually a really good guy. Um, he did everything he could to get rid of the racism, the xenophobia in his movement. Um, so I can't say anything about him, but uh, certainly lower level leaders of the party, so it's sort of particularly in British Columbia, but also um, uh, in, throughout the Western states, Alberta perhaps in particular, um, those sort of state level leaders did say a lot of the same things that um, Pauline Hanson was saying in Australia and Winston Peters and his party were saying uh, in New Zealand. So sort of a notion about uh, the problem, a problem with the native inhabitants, with the indigenous population, um, and they're getting they get handouts and there's problems and uh, and it's sort of not fair for the um, the white population because they get handouts and we don't and a sort of another sort of problem with immigrants immigrants taking over immigrants um, increase in racial strife and immigrants really uh, subverting the culture of the country so these are three the three um, sets of uh, populist movements. Um, the Tea Party in, in the United States has uh, at least uh, superficially some significant differences from these other parties, but there's also some significant similarities, and I'm going to explore those in the next few slides. So uh, we all kind of know the background of the Tea Party. It's February of 2009, right after, um, right after the election of Barack Obama, so really only three months later. And Rick Santinelli rants about the Homeowners Affordability and Stability Plan, which says it's sort of bad behavior and no one wants to subsidize the new, new nurse mortgage and it's all about taxes um, and we should have tea parties. Um, certainly this sort of seems very, very different. He's not talking about, Rick, Rick Santinelli's not talking about immigration. Um, uh, the tea party leaders don't appear to be talking about immigration. They're not talking about uh, native populations. They're not talking about, um, and they're not, they, so they appear to be talking very differently, uh, attracting a different class base. So the three, Canada, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand neo-populist movements seem classically neo-populist in terms of their class. So they're kind of lower middle class, shopkeepers, that sort of, we, if anyone knows, has French, uh, French background, it's Pujade movement in France, it's this classic movement, but the Tea Party doesn't seem to fit that. So my initial question was, can I even call the Tea Party a neo-populist movement? So, well, I don't know. Uh, and certainly, the, neo the Tea Party doesn't appear to be a party. It has party in the name, but it's not a political party, right? It's, uh, at, at most, uh, seems to be maybe if it institutionalized into part of the Republican Party, or at least it influences the party, but it's not in and of itself a political party. Australia and Canada and New Zealand all formed neo-populist political parties. So it's different. I don't even know what the, the Tea Party is. So I'm going to explore some of those things today. So first of all, who are the Tea Party? This is actually um, some research, and here also it's a computer, some research from uh, other political scientist, a very famous one called Alan Abramowitz, and he's actually using the congressional elections, uh, yeah, the congressional election study. It's a huge, really great data set. He's doing survey research, so it's a top. You have to trust this man's social uh, social research still. And this is what he finds. So these are Tea Party supporters and non-supporters because you can't be a member of the Tea Party. You just support them or you don't. It's very easy. The Tea Party supporters are older, so older than non-supporters, they're whiter than non-supporters, uh, they skew male, 
they seem married, they seem richer, slightly richer, uh, they, uh, they're slightly less um, educated, but only slightly, uh, they're more likely to be born again or evangelical by a law. Belief Bible is the actual word of God, um, and with the church door. These, um, these three factors, or the, these three questions that we ask, really are an indicator. We, we use this as evangelical voters, so if we add them all together, this is how we decide if somebody's an evangelical voter or not. So the Tea Party is complete, they're far more than the rest of the electorate um, evangelical. So you would imagine if it's just about taxes, they're just going to be libertarian and they're not going to care about belief systems. Actually, they're uh, very, very evangelical. Uh, they're more likely to be gun owners. That doesn't surprise anyone. That's sort of more what we think of as libertarian. And then we have some political and racial attitudes. They are almost entirely Republican, uh, or identify themselves as Republican. So 32% of non-supporters believe that they are 86% of Tea Party supporters say that they're Republicans. So the question is, was the Tea Party, as it initially proclaimed itself to be, uh, sort of independent, all comers, non-partisan? Well, at least by the time these polls were taken, so this is uh, October of 2010, by the time these, these polls were taken, the Tea Party was not non-partisan. It was a partisan. Um, movement. They're all, um, almost entirely conservative. <laughs> these are these are very significant numbers, you can see. Uh, and if you like Obama, eighty-four percent to twenty-seven percent. Uh, they like Palin. And this the this forty-four uh, um, percent uh, compared to twenty-two percent believe that Obama was not born in the United States. Um, And then there's a series of racial attitudes which sort of um, are, not, are, are almost as significant, which sort of say that they, um, the, uh, this is a series of questions which we use to get at, uh, it's not racism, but it's racial conservatism. So this notion that, um, so I hesitate to say what racism is because it's too messy. So we talk, talk about racial conservatism, sort of, the disagreement that they, you know, the feeling that if blacks worked harder, they would get on just as well as whites. But all they need to do is pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, that sort of thing. They don't think that blacks are victims of the system. Um, they think that blacks should try harder, and they shouldn't be shouldn't get any favors. And that's sort of um, where that skews. So those are the comparisons. This is a very interesting comparison. Um, in addition, well. One other um, really interesting uh, statistic is that, and I'll come back to it, but uh, Gary Jacobson, who's using a slightly different data set, which is the American National Election Study data set, and he found that um, only 13% of Tea Party supporters, this was about the same time, only 13% of Tea Party supporters during this period believed that Barack Obama was an American born Christian. Right? <laughs> That's 13% who believe that. Uh, do the math really quickly. That's a whole lot of Tea Parties who thought he was not born here or a Muslim. All three votes. Um, all right, so that's this comparison. So this is the, the next table that uh, Abraham Lewitz produced. It's actually Tea Parties compared to other Republicans. And I don't have the, um, the data for, for this, but there's another. I was at a round table um, on Friday and uh, with a whole bunch of people doing polling data on, on the Tea Party uh, state by state level, really interesting thing. And they said possibly even stronger. So as the Tea Party moves on, as it matures in, as an organization, it's actually these sort of effects are getting stronger. The, there is There are Republicans and there are Tea Party Republicans. So it's actually sort of more clearly forming a wing. Um, again, they're, they're older than other Republicans, they're whiter, uh, they're, they're, they're not necessarily white, sorry, they're, they're old Republicans are white, apparently. Uh, <laughs> they're male, they're, uh, ma they're, well, just as married, so all of these effects are not significant. Uh, the ones that are really significant are the, the age, uh, the, the, if you add all the 
evangelical stuff that's all all fit. There's just I don't even know that that's probably considering the size of the database that's not necessarily a statistical anomaly with a significant number of 44 percent to 42 percent have done over, over that. That's not big enough to make a difference. But the evangelical thing matters and the old. Republican ID, even compared to other Republicans, which is odd, um, very conservative ID, hate Obama more than other Republicans, 90% to 55%, just like Obama. They like Palin, 46% compared to 37% of general um, of ordinary Republicans, and um, all of the others are, are um, at least somewhat st uh, statistically significant. So, same sort of so compared to other Republicans. So you just sort of expect some differences between Tea Partiers and Tea Party supporters and um, the rest of the electorate, but this is Tea Party supporters compared to other people who are going to vote Republican. So this is very clear. What they, uh, the people that I talked to on, on Friday, the round table on Friday, discussed the fact that, in fact, um, the only there's a few, the slightly younger crowd uh, are actually libertarian um, for the Ron Paul people. Uh, the Ron Paul uh, Tea Partiers are there still. They're not as attached as they were two years ago. So the sort of young college Tea Partiers are detaching quicker than we thought um, they would. We thought they would attach further, but they're detaching uh, possibly as the media sort of has some like Tea Party or all crazy people uh, stuff that, that goes on, the younger people will be are detaching, detaching depending on um, where they're living. In Texas, not so much, but elsewhere, uh, the libertarian uh, strands are detaching. For Ron Paul, in Texas. Chris knows that. Party, what is it? So what is this thing that we call the Tea Party? Well, the clearest answer is that it's a social movement. So it's actually a, uh, in this sort of simple Venn diagram thing that we have. Um, social movements tend to um, deal with contentious politics in a particular way. So what we're dealing with is this sort of um, where contentious politics meets social movements. You can see that there's activism there. Um, and then institutions, institutions overlap with social movements too, and that's how, how you have the, uh, the Republican Party overlapping with the Tea Party. But it's in fact a social movement, and all political parties have originated as social movements. So sometimes social movements turn into political parties, and sometimes they don't. Um, and sometimes they get absorbed by political parties, and sometimes they don't. So, so what we are looking at is neopopulism, so, um, are we talking, so can I describe the Tea Party as, as a populist movement? And um, what I found in my previous research is that we have six particular um, interesting um, aspects or descriptive factors to neopopulism. And so, these are the six, producerism, anti-elitism, conspiratism, Conspiracism, which isn't actually a word, but it's a, I, I've made it up, so I use it all the time, and my word, my <coughs> word just tells me it's wrong all the time, like that as kid. Uh, and past directiveness and charismatic leadership. Oops. So, um, the, 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 this is really funny. Uh, last, let's see, when was it? A uh, couple of, uh, uh, last year sometime. Uh, I was on a panel with uh, uh, Dan Frost, who's a Tea Party guy from uh, Chicago, from as a radio guy from Chicago, um, and he can talk really well. Uh, and he said, as he was talking, he said, you know, uh, it's all about the tax leaders and wealth producers, and actually these are the exact same uh, descriptions that populists use all the time. They always talk about this. There's those wealth producers, evil wealth, um, 
those evil passengers, and we're the real producers. We're the, the valuable people in society, and then the people come and they, they, they eat our taxes. Uh, they eat the, the wealth of the land. They're, they're not the evil elite. However, when populists do it, and certainly um, William Jennings Bryan talks about this, the proto-populists in the 18th century Britain used these same terms. Um, but when neo-populists elsewhere use these terms, and when William Jennings Bryan used the term taxi and the wealth producers, the wealth producers were the farmers and the industrial workers, the, the factory workers, and the, the tax eaters typically were like railroad companies or uh, you know, taking the land around the railroads or, or taking handouts. But Dan Frost was saying the tax eaters were the, uh, you know, public, uh, the um, public sector employees who were protesting in Madison at the time, and the wealth producers were investors in Chicago. Um, so it's actually a complete flip of the way in which um, uh, the populists actually talked about it, but the rhetoric's the same. And if you talk about not not the you know, radio show talk show hosts or uh, the leaders, the elite leaders, if you talk to regular people, they see themselves as producers. They see that they've worked hard and they produce things and they're ordinary Americans. So it's kind of... Um, a different uh, way in which the elites see themselves versus the, the grassroots see. The grassroots of the Tea Party sees themselves. Throughout um, in, in international or throughout American history of populism, but also internationally, there's a lot of the ordinary person or the common man rhetoric, right? It's very important to see William Jennings Bryan, the ordinary person. Um, this is all about the, the regular guy. Um, in Australia, that's called the little Aussie babbler. Um, don't know why. Uh, <laughs> in New Zealand, they all the populists talked about <coughs> number eight wire, uh, you know, the number eight wire bloke. And the number eight wire person is a sort of person who can fix a truck with a coat hanger, right? Number eight wire, you can just rig it. It's basically producerism, and this is, comes back to the notion that um, we don't need anything. We have the, the real knowledge is common knowledge, and uh, it's common sense. It's the common sense of the ordinary person, and this is how you get simple solutions to complex problems. And I very, I very much distrust simple solutions to complex problems. All we, any, any politician who says all we need to do is immediately say, "I think you're full of it," um, because they probably are. Uh, because there's, it's always much more complex than that. All the international. Um, all the, all the neo-populists really do talk in this way. Canada talks about Joe Sixpack. They don't have anything as colorful as Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> anti-elitism does show itself in two ways. So a political anti-elitism, this notion of the Washington establishment, which is really clear in all of the neo-populist anti-elite uh, feeling is, is one of the, it's the core of populism. They distrust centers of power. In Australia, it's the Canberra establishment. Um, it's also anti-intellectualism, both in terms of the media and in terms of science. So <coughs> common sense knowledge versus scientific knowledge. Common sense will win every time, right? Science isn't real. Science, well, they don't really know that. They, well, they're telling us they don't really know. They don't know how an aspirin works. They don't, uh, first one, one minute they're telling you that eggs are bad for you and now they're good for you again. Uh, they don't really know these things. So, a clear favoring of the knowledge that comes from just living. And distrust of nation states, international commitments are really clear, particularly in the UN. So this is where these classic conspiracy narratives come in. William, uh, William Jennings Bryan was a conspiracy theorist, um, but uh, not quite as inventive as some of the ordinary people that you find on um, not the central, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about web pages later, but not this sort of central Tea Party organization um, web pages that are funded by, a uh, top down ones that are funded by Freedom Works and other organizations, but really just sort of more general Tea Party blogs tend to have a lot more conspiracy theories. They typically 
are Jewish banjo conspiracies. Oh, there's several. Uh, the first one is this Jewish banjo conspiracy theory. So this is the notion that um, that the um, the Federal Reserve Bank is actually a plot by uh, the like the Rothschilds and, and various other Jewish elites, um, and that they're using it to take over the world. Um, and this is actually the response to Ron Paul when he wants to take the bank down. They're thrilled about this because they're pretty sure that um, the Federal Reserve Bank is being used to, um, as by the UN to take over, or by Jewish bankers to take over the world. This is really old conspiracy theory. This has really very, very long roots in American history, um, all the way back to the early 19th century, the, the founding of the bank in the first place, and before that even. Um, so there's always been a Jewish bank of conspiracy theory within the populist movement before there was a Federal Reserve Bank they were sure that the Jewish bankers were going to control the world somehow. Um, so you'll see a lot of this, um, <coughs> this uh, within the American Tea Party movement. Um, if you go to, and uh, all you have to do is type in Federal Reserve Bank conspiracy theory, and Tea Party web pages will pop up with various uh, resources to tell you exactly what's going on. And they'll also pop up with a very old now, um, a link to an old video, well, not a video, uh, a podcast. Um, but I've seen this before. In my research on, in Australia, I was uh, 20 minutes into an interview with someone I thought was a perfectly rational individual um, talking. Uh, there was a candidate, it was a, there was a, a One Nation candidate, and he seemed to be very reasonable, and I was writing notes, and um, he became more and more relaxed. And he, <coughs> Wait here, I've got something to show you. Oh, it, it's all about the Jews. And he went and he got to his car and he brought a now this is Australia where I mean there are fewer there are fewer Jews in Australia than there than there is alcohol in American beer. Like it's like less than 0.3%. Uh, and they brought this and he brought this VHS tape out and I had to, to watch it and it's the Money Makers, it's called The Money Makers, you can go watch it, it's hilarious. Uh, and it's all about how the Jewish bankers are controlling the world through the banks. And it's the same, they're using the same material. Uh, so the narrative is similar. The narrative is all the same. It's, it's, this is the strongest, um, the strongest evidence. They talk about the Trilateral Commission and the Committee 300, which has, when was the second on, is part of the Committee 300, by the way? Uh, and these central bank conspiracy theories. They're also worried about the Bank of England. Um, and then one world government narratives, um, Michelle Bachman being well and truly into the one world government um, theme, uh, Glenn Beck and the Amero. So does anyone know about the Amero? Yes, this is great. Uh, hugely, hugely in, uh, entertaining conspiracy theories. Uh, the Amero is, uh, Glenn Beck says, what's happening is the Federal Reserve Bank is just going to print money until American money is worthless, then it's going to pay off all our debts, and then we're going to have a new currency that's called the Amero, and it's going to be bank backed with land, and how the government's going to get the land is um, all the mortgages held by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going to be taken and, and given to, and, and used to back the bank, the, the Amero. Oh, and it's going to be with Canada and Mexico. <laughs> like the Euro, right? The, okay, it's a beautiful one. It's very entertaining. Uh, and the other one is Agenda 21. My colleague Matt Lindstrom said the only people in America should know about Agenda 21, which is a sustainable, it's the UN plan for sustainable economic development. Um, and the only people in America who know about it are the Tea Party. So, <laughs> and you know, so, so it's, it's not a plan to take over the world. Um, Michelle Bachman honestly thinks this is. It's not a UN plan to uh, wreck America. Uh, it's just about, you know, it's do small. It's a, it's an urban planning sort of thing to have green space. Um, but European cities are in on it. Um, American no. All right. There are, however, of course, conspiracy narratives with no historical links in the Tea Party, and not very many. Um, 
over. So this is the group of conspiracy. And then once Obama had actually, not, not that it changed anybody's mind, uh, but once Obama had actually sort of insisted that Hawaii go and produce its long form, his long form birth certificate, um, about, um, about three weeks later, um, this National Born Citizen narrative came uh, up on the Tea Party blogs, and that is that he still can't be uh, legally president of the United States. So people who was born in America, you have to have both parents born because you have to be a national, national born citizen. In order to be a national born citizen, you have to have both parents be born in the United States, which is, of course, constitutionally not true, but um, that's how they work. All right, so here is the way in which the original sort of impetus for the Tea Party in practice has sort of given away, um, and that is this nativism, which is not about black people, although some people argue that it's still, there's still a hint of that, but if you talk to Seth Stockwell, who's done field work on this, um, and Vanessa Williams, um, they both think that that's less of an issue than the uh, worry about immigration. And it's not just racist xenophobia, rather it's more, it's framed as cultural protection. And the same is true of neo-populists in other countries. So we want to keep our, it's ridiculous that we can't celebrate Christmas in our schools, it's ridiculous that we can't, um, uh, we can't have, we, we celebrate every other festival, but we can't celebrate our own national cultural um, festival. So in the schools we're just celebrating, um, you know, the Muslim ch ch children's festival, or the Asian festivals, but they can't celebrate the, um, the Australian one. So the rhetoric is all cultural protection, um, and that is true of the Tea Party rhetoric as well. It's significantly anti-Muslim. So that all of the people that I talked to on Friday and on um, Thursday when I uh, talked to Vanessa Williams and Sarah Stockwell, they were all, they, the, the important thing is it's very anti-Muslim, and they're very open about Vanessa um, has just wrote a book on the Tea Party and has done a huge amount of field research on this. She says that, at least in her neck of the woods, it does appear that some of the older Tea Party uh, are confusing sort of Black Panther uh, Islam or Nation of Islam um, Muslims with, um, with more modern International comparisons are the same. There's the war on Christmas um, in, in all the other countries. So that, that was a consistent thing. It's like if immigrants just have to, um, if only they would just behave like the Irish immigrant teachers or the Germans or whoever. The other, the last thing is it's passed direct through national history. It's sort of belonging to this golden age, which is usually mythical. Um, now, Tea Party, you would think, would be longing for the founding, but that actually doesn't turn out to be true. And if you do uh, field research or you ask them what they want is the 1950s. Um, and the same is true internationally, the way it used to be, sort of free, fair, stable. Um, all of this seems to be activated by uh, sort of worry over globalization and, and rapid modernization. The sixth thing is charismatic leadership. <coughs> and certainly there are clear comparisons. This is a picture of Pauline Hanson and One Nation. Um, and of course, those that have clear charismatic leaders, we know who that leader is. Uh, and the Tea Party doesn't appear to have a leader. There are focus, there are spokespeople like Glenn Beck, but there are also some clear positive leaders or, or at least token leaders that are accepted. Um, and the other one, uh, that's who Sarah Palin, of course. So I would argue there's a lot of com uh, at least rhetorical comparison. Um, but also there's, uh, there's at least one very prominent media personality who's um, actively involved in engaging uh, support in each of the neo-populist movements that I look at. So why February 2009? Well, this is actually Gary Jacobson's um, data set, um, and the opinions are really there's a couple of things. Any progressive democratic president was going to, to 
to have a lot of reaction. But a black president's going to have a big one. And the Tea Party is a significant reaction to a black British president by a subset of Americans, um, and they're that subset. So um, all of the all the people that I talked to um, over this weekend agreed with me on this, um, that this is really a reaction um, because the, the, and combined with a recession, but the recession was happening before, um, was happening under Bush, uh, the, the budget was going into overdrive um, under Bush, so you know, it, it doesn't make any sense, but it was just budget pressures, there is just a, there's a clear reaction, it's a clear, clear reaction to a Democratic president running. Right? Um, I have one last thing, I think. Can you just take that? Oh, um, the other issue is, um, it's, not, uh, it's not on this part of the slide, so I've just, I just done the other part too, but uh, the other issue is the way the way in which Fox News, or how does Fox News play into this? Um, there does a clear, uh, Fox News and other media outlets have a clear <coughs> influence on um, whether a particular, if the, say for example, a Tea Party group has a web page that's connected more strongly to Fox News, it appears to have a better chance of surviving. So there are some other issues, and uh, one of them is Fox News, and you can see um, you know, Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11 and the WMD issue, all of those also correlate, um, I don't know if I've seen the shows, but if you're a Fox News viewer, you also believe in that same set of issues, right? So natural colonies, uh, the, the Iraq probably had WMDs, the WMDs were found in Iraq, and Saddam Hussein was involved in 9-11, all correlate with Fox News watching as well. All right, so I would just like to Tea Party movement is dwindling down, but do you know is the percentage of people who agree with at least some of the political uh, agenda of the Tea Party movement is that staying consistent or rising, or is that going down as well? In other words, people who are not Tea Partiers but who agree with a lot of the political right. principles. Who wouldn't identify, but who still agree? Uh, yeah, that's probably the same because people don't actually change their minds. Um, but what you don't have is you know some of the people who attach. Because they were concerned about the debt, or they were concerned about uh, taxes, or they were upset about the recession, or whatever, they now think, well, I'm not going to associate myself with the rest of the Tea Party, the anti immigrant stuff. I'm not interested in the anti immigrant stuff. That's why I said the libertarians, they're still libertarians, they still believe that. They're just not going to attach anymore because they don't want the rest of the anti immigrant stuff. They're, we're libertarians, we don't care about that. They don't want the, the gay agenda, they don't care. You know, they're just libertarians. And they don't. And at least, I haven't seen the polling data out of Texas, but at least um, the guys I talked to were Ohio, Washington State, um, and some East Coast states. They all said, yeah, the libertarians are detaching, or have already detached. Okay. Right? Yeah. Right. But no one's actually changed their mind. No one ever changes their mind. They just change their identity, identification. Well, right. Could you uh, 
just give some greater definition to the to the focus of the energy uh, towards immigrant groups and what that's about um, and where it's focused or kind of if you can mm -hmm. the shape of that thrust in in the, in the country right now if, if, if that's possible I don't know. yeah um, and it's really difficult because I think it's different um, state by state so your border communities are very different um, and so you can see why Arizona is so um, churned up by this now but so Atlanta is too so there are states where um, this is really a hot issue um, which is deeply concerning to some aspects of the Republican Party so this is why the Tea Party sometimes yells about establishment Republicans because the business Republicans do not want to and, and uh, well yeah financial fiscal conservative some fiscal conservative and very and lots of the business community that is in the Republican Party are very concerned about that so this is a, a push from the Tea Party to sort of make these more stringent laws but of course you know carrying ID is not a libertarian principle <laughs> um, so the push is certain states are strongly anti-immigrant and the Tea Party is, is um, pushing that way with um, forces that were already there that sort of adopt this <coughs> and in other states that's not the case at all um, so yeah but you can still see even in, even in Minnesota there were some sort of Tea Party uh, candidates who produced um, flyers with pictures of, of people climbing walls which makes no sense there's no wall in this I mean there's no, there's no immigrants jumping fences to get into Minnesota uh, because the Canadians can just come and go we don't need uh, yeah, so there's there's still some of the same rhetoric, even though the push here is a little a little different. Um, so uh, maybe we should build a wall across. I don't know for anybody. It would be hard, but yeah. Uh, so so it is. I don't know the extent. I I, I should look this up, but the extent of anti-immigrant feeling uh, in America probably it's higher, but that's typical of. So when, when the economy is booming, no one cares, let them in, we don't care. If the economy is harder, in general, not just the Tea Party, but most Americans get worried. You know, the, the, the union, um, union interests within the Democratic Party are also very concerned about immigration, um, legal and illegal. So yeah, you can see this, and, and part of that is uh, the general notion is, is uh, and an immigrant feeling is because of the so there's sort of a confluence of variables here that are causing um, concern. Um, if you think about it too, all of these countries, so Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and America, all have huge um, non-native non born populations. So Australia's about 19% of the population wasn't born in Australia. America's about 12%. So these are huge numbers compared to other countries. Canada. claims that they have uh, made adjustments and accommodations what it really means is you knuckle under or else <coughs> at least that's the way the bishops understand it and it does seem so because uh, it's going to go through the courts eventually and how the courts will decide is something else again uh, <coughs> and the, the legislation in this country 
country has been beginning in the late nineteenth century when the protestant majority feared catholic growth in power they put through what were called blaine amendments which tried to keep catholics from becoming politically effective and and then more recently in this affordable health care act the congress passed by a very slight majority only about nine or ten votes both parties the affordable health care act which was stripped of the so-called hyde amendments which had forbidden the federal government to fund abortions and that is further you know loss of political influence among catholics and president obama seems absolutely adamant in enforcing that so we are we are forced to take a position with the uh... evangelicals and these people who are called extreme conservatives would you answer that uh... yeah i you know there's a uh... certainly obamacare was the focus of a lot of the tea party uh... sort of original because it was a progressive agenda right so it is aimed at uh... increasing access to all but at least the uh... the affordable care act did not have any uh... did not have any thing that the bishops were worried about so the bishops were fine with the i believe with obamacare as it was originally written with the affordable care act as it was originally promulgated the hyde amendment itself was passed uh... every time as soon as any democrat gets in the hyde amendment prohibitions go away and as soon as the republican president comes back they they come back in again uh... so that was not uh... part of the so the hyde amendment forbids the hyde amendment actually forbids any foreign aid being given to foreign countries which so any organization any ngo which cannot provide information about abortion in foreign countries if they're going to get foreign aid money so that's the hyde amendment so uh... so that was already out of the affordable care act the affordable care act itself doesn't have any of these other things so the problem that the bishops had was actually with this executive order piece which uh... said that a catholic institution has to provide uh... their insurance uh... has to provide insurance which has birth control uh... in it so uh... yeah that's the bishops concern uh... now of course president biden but you talk about catholic influence so vice president biden uh... who is catholic uh... was very concerned and uh... i thought that he had arranged uh... sort of went actually to the white house brought the catholic uh... i think the bishop the archbishop of new york was it was it dolan yeah and uh... they attempted to to find some way in which this could be passed through so that the catholic churches so so his issue so uh... obama's uh... response was to make insurance companies pay so that they had to be free and uh... that's how they've done so that the catholic church does not have to so catholic institutions which provide health care or subsidize health care for their uh... or pay part of the health care for their employees don't have to pay for the insurance that provides birth control so this is how that's the the swing uh... so in terms of catholic influence on uh... on these issues i would say that and the bishops themselves have huge influence so i still think that catholic influence over outcomes of politics are are still pretty significant the tea party is another uh... is hugely influential in and of itself whether that's uh... evangelical the christian right was hugely influential throughout the nineties and so and continues to be and the tea party uh... is uh... the tea party's influence is also going to be strong so the tea party even though we talk about political ago age Few people who are willing to uh, to describe themselves as such. The Tea Party is continuing to have that influence and will influence well um, because the Tea.
place, but the Tea Party will continue to vote. They're older. They will vote. They will turn out, and they will be active grassroots. So the same is true, I think, of, um, of uh, Catholic populations um, who have always been politically active. I don't see any decrease in uh, Catholic <coughs> involvement in politics. It's always been part of what the Catholics do. And what any what do you think? Dan, do you really think you need a microphone? Really? Well, I don't know. I thought <laughs> My question is, is, is the Tea Party really a movement, uh, or is it just a particular label that a group of conservative, strong Republicans happened to use uh, since February of 2009? Because, you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to see up there, but, you know, what are the terms of new uh, voters? Because, you know, there's been a, a strong group of, or a group of strong conservative Republicans that that voted to elect and re-elect George W. Bush. There's a strong group, uh, or a group of strong conservative Republicans that had the New Gingrich Revolution 99, Ronald Reagan and so forth. Are these pe is this a new thing, or is, it, is the Tea Party a new movement, or is it a particular label that people started to use in 2009, and we now see, no, like you said, due to criticisms and other things, are no longer using this particular label. So is it a movement or a label? It's a movement, and it's not astroturf. Um, for the astro, it's not. Uh, it's not just top down. It's bottom up stuff. Uh, these are people who know, who believe certain things. So it's a movement. You know, you can't just say, oh, you know, they're just. <coughs> just because you've been involved in politics once, and you now you're involved in this other activity, or this other sort of concerned about this other set of things, uh, doesn't mean that that it's not a movement. So yeah, it's still a movement. Uh, maybe the same people, or a lot of the same people, but it's still a movement. Um, and it's bottom up, although there are elites. So yeah, and a legitimate, strong movement with lots of people. Um, one of the interesting things that um, the Dennis Rockwell is a really, really important political scientist, and, and she's done a lot of research on this. And what she says, which I think is very interesting, is that um, the difference between um, you know, sort of left-wing liberals and the Tea Party uh, is that the Tea Party um, is entirely wrong on aspects of what's in policy. They have no clue what's actually in the policy. They are they were absolutely convinced that the Affordable Care, ha Care Act has death panels. Uh, they will they will look look in your face and say, yep, that they have death panels in there, and if you're all going to die at the age of seventy, and it's all going to have a healthcare removed. Um, but they know exactly how to be active, they, how to do a, a political process. So they know what it would take to complain to their local alderman, uh, to the, the mayor, they know how to change a bill in the state, and they know how to raise money and run for election, and how to make sure that the Tea Party caucus members in Congress are doing the right thing. They know all of that. And that's valuable, valuable information. So they are active, they're involved, they're civically engaged, as we want everyone to be. They're the civically engaged people. Um, but they're kind of really mistaken on a lot of policy issues. So, you know, Saddam Hussein was involved in Iran Lebanon, you know, they keep that. Um, they're, they're just wrong. Uh, whereas um, the people on the left are better about <coughs> what the content of policy. They know exactly what the content of their policy is. So if you ask them, what should be done to fix the problem? No clue how to do that. They don't know how to do it. They would say Obama should give us food, and every political scientist goes, "Ah, uh, <laughs> you're an idiot." Um, so there is that. Uh, these people, the, the the people that we talk about at the Tea Party, have are deeply engaged in American politics. They are deeply engaged in, in the civic work of the nation, and uh, you know we we should value them for that. These are people who are going to vote. They're social movements. They're, they're real. And they're making the people that they voted in in, a, in 2010, they're holding them their feet to the fire. They didn't break down as much as you were going nuts in your internship as last summer in Washington, D.C. The Tea Party caucus wouldn't, wouldn't make a bargain, wouldn't make that 9 to 1 bargain, wouldn't even make a 20 to 1 bargain. Right? And 
however traumatic that was, um, that's what they believe, right? Now, what happens next, I don't know, because if you can't compromise, you can't lose country, but there you go. What then, um, presuming that Romney does get the um, yeah, we're gonna nomination, uh, what what role will the Tea Party have? Because they're not great supporters of Romney, from what I've gathered. Right. But are they going to be able to influence the platform, or is Romney just going to use rhetoric that appeals to them without really uh, intending to do? They just well, hate it, right? Yeah. So what 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 role will the Tea Party play in the in the campaign and the election? Uh, yeah. That, uh, you know, I'm a political scientist, so I'm going to take my best to watch here. Uh, <laughs> um, possibly a lot. So because these are are committed Republicans, and so they, they're not going to vote, they're not going to switch their votes. Some of them might not turn out, but I doubt it. I think they are going to. Um, whether they can get, you know, in terms of grassroots movement, so if they're there and they can bring five people who are kind of on, on the margins, which is what they need to be back then, um, they'll go, everyone goes to vote. Uh, the committed Tea Party supporters will still be in the electorate, and they will be voting for Romney. Uh, are their friends and neighbors who are kind of sensitive in there? Maybe not. So it's all, this election will be all about turnout because we all know no one changes their mind. No one suddenly says, well, that's, I've always voted Republican, but that looks like a good Democrat to vote for. They just don't. No one. Uh, they just stay home. So, yeah, and I think the Tea Party will always have an influence because it will have an influence at, you know, at, uh, in the congressional races. I don't think that influence is going away soon. Although, I've been wrong before. Many times. <laughs> the PACs were made to be like the congressional race in two years. Uh, super PACs, yep. Uh, so there, there are super PACs, but not as many. Um, and the Tea Party, there are, of course, there's, there's the Tea Party uh, knows how to, knows how to raise money, but that's not their strength. That's not, I mean, you know, their strength is, is really, some of them just aren't interested in raising money for a particular candidate. They know how to do ground game. And, and that's where they'll be really important. If you don't have that, you don't have anything. of the Koch brothers on funding the Tea Party? Oh, yeah. Well, this is the argument I could go with the brothers of, of uh, it's Cato and, um, well, the brothers of Cato are having a little argument right now, but um, uh, is it atrophy? And, you know, I know. Oh, sorry. Astroturf is like grassroots movement, but fake, right? So astroturf movement is like, it's not really grassroots, it, it's, it's fabricated grassroots. So we call it astroturf. Um, AstroTurf campaigns, you, you, if you're at, at all involved, um, or if you, you know, I don't know, I don't know how you get these emails, but uh, if you've ever seen an email that comes in and says, send this, or you probably would have seen this, send this email to your member of Congress, and they've given it all out for you, and you just press the button, that's kind of AstroTurf, false. right? False. false, sort of like, oh yeah, sign this, no really, it's about this, um, that's, that's what they and uh, join this, we'll pay for it. And you know, paying for you know, you have a have you mobilize for a um, a march, but you know, three of three quarters of the people are just there for the pizza uh, that they've been promised afterwards. Um, so we know they're all they're all college students because we know you're cheap. Uh, <laughs>
Are not? Uh, apparently, at least, it's a swing group uh, that like 35 year old male Catholic, white male Catholics are actually the middle of the, of the voting section. Not women, just women are swinging away from 